physics is not the best subject to work on. And again, in chemistry, when we look at atoms, molecules, subatomic particles, it's all numbers, 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 the whole way right. through. So I believe that an understanding of numbers uh, we can describe as the doorway which leads us into the an understanding, leads us into an understanding of so many of the other sciences. And if we then refer to something very basic and simple, if I wish to go across to the little corner shop and buy a newspaper, there are numbers involved in my understanding of the money that I have to give the news agent. The newspaper pages are numbered, and those two very simple things, I give over a certain amount of cash in order to buy sheets of paper which contain a given number of words. We may think that numeracy and illiteracy are fairly well separated as areas of study, but they're not. Because when, if you're editing a program, you need to say to yourself, if this guy is speaking at roughly 180 words a minute, how do I leave, how long do I need him on my program to get him to get through the questions I want to ask him? Um, <laughs> in the same way, if you are physically editing a paper or a magazine or a journal or putting something up on a blog, then the numbers come into the words, and the words are dependent on the numbers. And think of all the codes, like the Enigma coding machine so important for espionage and for breaking the German codes during World War II. That machine puts messages and numbers together so that we might argue that without numbers, there would not be anything like the clarity of the message. And think of Mr. Morse and his amazing code of little dots and dashes. It's numbers again that turn the dots and dashes into comprehensible letters. And I would say that numbers underlie almost everything that we do. And they are an essential part of our planning and our strategies. Uh, when we're trying to solve the household budget problems. If, right. I, if I buy A, I cannot also buy B until next week. And if I want C, I've got to save up for two months. So <laughs> you see how, how vitally important numbers are in our everyday lives and in the lives of the pioneering scientists who take us to the next stage of development. There's an old saying, um, Men lie, women lie, numbers don't. And I believe that's true. Absolutely true. Well, but I would, I would certainly go along with that, that, shall we say, even the most ethical people uh, sometimes feel that they uh, uh, have to say something which is not strictly true. It can well be in, uh, you know, in the ethical sense when, uh, you know, you, you might say that, uh, Someone who has been rather hesitant and timid and is at a, a stage of adolescent life where they're trying to gain a bit of confidence. And I can think of this in my years as a headmaster. You would sometimes get in a real relaxed situation. One of your senior students would have gone out and uh, bought a jacket or bought a, a piece of something, something that he was hoping to wear at a, a school dance or that he was hoping to wear to take his girlfriend out and look good. And he would say, sir, do I look better in this? Well, <laughs> w without being dishonest or, you know, saying he's the sort of kid who is a rather odd shape to begin with, and no matter how good his <laughs> tailor was, he's still going to look an odd shape. And I'm afraid, I must confess, I said, yes, John, you look terrific. Have a good time at the day. And I'm trying to build up his confidence uh, not to damage it when it's already pretty feeble. So I, I think it. there are occasions when you may tell 
with the best of moral intentions, you can tell what's normally called a, a white lie. You can exaggerate the achievement that the poor boy has made. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so what do you think about time slips? I mean, uh, have you done any research on Yes, this? I have. Uh, in fact, uh, Patricia and I have done a book on the mysteries of time. And I think that these investigations, uh, you know, when we were talking about earlier how the um, human race, human curiosity, human thought is taking us further and further and further into a, a new world of human ability to do things that we've never done before, just as flight wasn't possible um, more than 200 years ago. I believe that if we haven't already met them, we will meet time travelers. I, I'm not sure what time is. If I was, I could make a fortune out of it. But uh, I believe that we will bring it under our control, or we will, at the very least, learn how to maneuver through it. You know Shakespeare's quote about how time seems to stand still and then how it seems to race with some people and how it goes at a normal pace with others. I think that time can be a very subjective experience. And even though we have these amazing um, atomic clocks that are accurate to within a tiny fraction of a millisecond, that this although it's very useful for scientific purposes and for other experimentation, it's not what you and I, as human beings with subjective mental experiences, understand by time. I can be in a happy situation. Let's suppose, um, for example, our our daughters and sons-in-law for our 40th anniversary treated us to our first ever ride in a hot air balloon. Now, it probably lasted no more than 20 minutes, but it seemed <coughs> as if it was lasting a century. We absolutely loved it. It was amazing. And we were happy and excited, and, and it, it just experientially, it got everything on the boil. And when we have moments like that, when we have an experience which is so exciting, so interesting, um, you see a magnificent view which 500 years ago was painted by a great artist, or you go up into a, a mountain range and you look around and you realize you can very nearly see from one side of England to the other. And you're, you feel ecstatic about this. And it's in those moments that time doesn't operate as it does when you're sitting at your desk dealing with an enormous stack of routine correspondence that has to be done before the end of the week. And the last thing you want to do is bother with it. So if we look first, but the first part of my argument would be to take the subjectivity of time and to ask ourselves whether that gives us any clue to its real nature. Now, my other thought is that if we can only find a way of transferring that subjective approach to time into the time that is objective, and if our experiences can be crammed into a very short portion of time, and yet by cramming them in, we feel as if we've lived a hundred years, and only two minutes have passed on the clock. So I think that we will eventually learn to control time, either as a medium through which we can travel. See, I sometimes wonder, I would link this up with the UFO phenomena, the, uh, uh, the UFOs. And I wonder whether some of them are not strange aliens from another part of the universe, extraterrestrials. Right. I wonder whether it's somebody from the future who has popped back to have a look at right. us. Absolutely. 
So, do you believe that we are the only intelligent life in the universe? Uh, well, if I look at it statistically, I would say that it seems almost impossibly unlikely. Right. If we think the universe is almost infinite, it is just so gargantuan. We've got billions of star systems. And in those billions of star systems, there are billions of planets. Right. And within those billions of planets, there will be many other habitable ones. And again, they don't have to be like Earth in order to contain some other form um, of intelligent life. See, we cannot... Well, we can speculate, but that's all we can do, as to whether the stars themselves, which are masses of flaming gas at enormous temperatures, uh, there's absolutely no way that biological life as we understand it with a carbon-based molecule could live on the sun or on any other planet. But what if there are beings of pure energy who are independent of temperature and what we might call flame beings, for instance, or energy. The atomic structure in the stars is so amazing that it's possible that there are living beings who are made of, shall we say, pure energy, just as we are energy. made of biological yeah. matter. And right. there's no reason why thought cannot exist in a, a living flame, just as it exists in you and me with our carbon-based molecules talking to each other over the phone. <laughs> and so I, I think that there are certainly vast numbers of intelligent life forms, and uh, I rather suspect that some of them have been to visit us already. I think so. Yeah, you do too. Yeah. Yes. You yeah. know, um... My mother, she saw three huge bright objects in the sky, just just hovering mm -hmm. for hours, and she was sure they were not, you know, from here. Yes. So, do you have any stories, any wonderful stories of people actually meeting some of these visitors or, you know? Well, uh, I used to work years ago when we lived in East Anglia with a very nice guy called Johnson, whose uh, job, and he was trained as an engineer originally, but in his early retirement, he worked for half a dozen national newspapers in being their man in East Anglia who would deal with any reports of UFOs that had been phoned in to these particular national papers. And he spoke to me one day about the most exciting experience that he had ever had with a young man who was um, an electrical engineer and who, like engineers who go around helping people when they have breakdowns, he had a, a van load of tools and other measuring equipment, you know, voltmeters and the rest of the gear. And he was driving home at a, an area of North Norfolk called Holt, H-O-L-T, the town. And quite suddenly, the engine on his otherwise perfectly behaving van cut out. He was very puzzled by this, looked around to see if there was anything strange in the 